All right, ladies and gentlemen, our one minute is up. Uh, thank you to take a seat and just once again turn to that table next to you and say, very good, very good. We're going to jump right into our next panel. In this next hour, we have four individuals with disabilities who want to share their personal experiences and provide insight on how, how Albertans with disabilities might discover their career potential. On stage, we have Francine Berube. She has many years of experience as an administrative assistant. She recently lost her longtime position during an organizational downsizing and is currently looking for permanent employment while offering house and pet sitting services. Bill Brandon is an independent management consultant with over 25 years experience during his career. He's been an entrepreneur, an executive with a national consulting firm, and a senior manager in government and a leader in the not-for-profit sector. Shauna Helm is a certified management accountant. She's worked in the nonprofit and private sectors over the last 14 years. She sits on the City of Evanston's advisory board for persons with disabilities. Terry Robson is a teacher and motivational speaker. Terry has struggled to understand and accept the impact of Asperger's syndrome on her life. She's determined to share what she's learned with others. And taking over my job for the next hour is Paralympic gold medalist Carrie Anton. Carrie won gold at the Sydney Paralympic Summer Games in 2000 in the sport of goalball. I won't say more about her. Instead, we have a short video of Carrie at work or play. This is Carrie. Carrie is an on air reporter, a gold winning Paralympian, and is legally blind with about 4% vision. What I see uh, is like really like I can tell like the walls behind you are like cream colored, I think. Give me the tour. <laughs> this, is, this is the cubicle, this is where I hang out most of my day. Carrie works for Athabasca University in accessibility. The first thing we need is a coffee maker. It's Carrie's job to make courses accessible for students with disabilities. The next thing is a scanner because a lot of material is print and so mm -hmm. we need to convert print into electronic format in order to make the print version accessible. Carrie's specialty is assistive technology. This monitor that has a funky sit-stand arm on it so that I can raise it and lower it. And when I sit there, my head is right here with this other apparatus called the closed circuit magnifying system. A lot of forms, a lot of things I got to fill out for people, and I can change the color contrast as well. But the most useful technology is the stuff that a lot of people already own. So I can magnify the screen. Virtuoso, one square, night sky two. My iPhone helps me by reading my messages to me, but it also is my magnifying system. Friday, April 4th. Like in, in the past, five years, I would say mainstream technology has really sort of caught up yeah. and become more universal design, which is what we want with the whole concept of universal design. Details. Day. Back button. Goal ball. I'm a gold medalist in the sport of goal ball. And goal ball is a team sport for the blind. It's three on three, played on the gym floor. You have a ball the size of a basketball that makes noise. And you put this ball back and forth on the gym floor, trying to score on the goal between both teams. The hitch is that everyone's blindfolded. No one can see what's going on. Carrie coaches goal ball locally, helping new players and provincial athletes develop their skills. Okay, so let's start by doing five slides each. Do you want to call it out? Yeah, I've, I call a lot of these people my kids because I, I've known them since they were kids or you know, help teach them technology or help them somewhere down the line and then now I get to you know, play goal ball with them. So it's, it's really a great experience. I love it. Carrie pushes her players to work hard and challenge themselves. It's this kind of adventurous and competitive spirit that got Carrie where she is today. One of my Paralympic friends, Vivian Forrest, she was getting interviewed and they were looking for reporters, AMI, and as they were interviewing her, she said, well, you should talk to my friend Carrie Anton. And uh, that's how I basically <laughs> got the job with AMI. Carrie, uh, you want to back up a moment? There are new challenges, but Carrie thinks being low vision has benefited her reporting. Doing a story on Paris women, this fellow was in a wheelchair, and I'm standing like, I'm only five foot four, but he kept having to crank his head like that. Oh, right? yeah, so yeah. I just took it down a level. I went totally. on my knees. For Accessible Media, this is Carrie Anton. I'm Carrie Anton for Accessible Media. For Accessible Media, I'm Carrie Anton. It's really important that parents and teachers let kids with disabilities fall let them get bruised, let them eat dirt. They're not gonna die, you know, that's really important. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, and I wanna do a shout out to Premier Hancock. Woohoo!
<laughs> just fair is fair, uh, tit for tat. I am very excited to be here um, and chatting, having the opportunity to chat with um, these great panelists um, and have them share their experiences based on long-term and career-based um, employment. Um, for me, that means finding meaningful opportunities that I can um, be productive, I can contribute, and I really enjoy what I do, and I know that's through my career. So we're going to kick things off um, by starting with asking the entire panel. Uh, we'll kind of go through the, um, from one end to the other. And we're, if we have qu time for questions in the end, we will um, ask them. So write them down or ask your neighbor to help you remember what the question is you had. So the first thing I want to um, ask the panelists is to tell us about um, their current employment situation. What was your best ever job and what was your worst ever job and why? Terry, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I don't know that I can honestly say I remember my best ever job. Maybe it was so bad I blacked it out. I'm not sure. My, that's very worst ever job. My best ever job is the one I have now. I own my own company. I speak to people about Asperger's syndrome and what it was like growing up without a diagnosis. And I also work as a specialized learner support for a program called EARS, which is Employment Retention Enhancement Services. And I help students who are looking to um, work towards a career path, or start some post-secondary education where they may need some upgrading. But that's what I do and that's what I love and I want to do that until the day I die. Great. Francine, how about you? My worst job was cleaning and I had done it for a long time, so that's why I do not like, I, I just got, am sick of doing it. <laughs> and then the best of job of all is working in the office. I have lots of things that I have liked to work on and work more on. I guess for me, um, the, the worst job I ever had, uh, in fact the only job I was ever fired from was a job where I was trying to be something I'm not. I was trying to be a, um, an office clerk effectively. So it didn't work too well for somebody with poor vision, uh, especially because it was all paper based at that time. Now my best job is, uh, and I guess it's always been this way except for that one job I got fired from, it's always been the job I currently have. And now I'm self-employed and have been for about 13 years. Great. Shauna? Hi. Um, I am right now currently unemployed due to my own demise. I chose to move to a different career path. And so I'm currently looking for employment or a million dollars, whatever comes first. So, <laughs> um, my best job ever was working with a nonprofit, and I really enjoyed this is because the nonprofit was no titles. Everyone did whatever they could to get the job done. And they also respected everyone's um, ability, opinion, disability, it didn't matter. It was just whatever the, um, they chose to do. Great, thanks everyone. Um, I just want you folks to know in the audience that I'm not clairvoyant. Um, we have done pre-interviews, so I know a bit about these folks, and they've agreed to share some of their stories and history about you, about themselves. Um, Bill, I want to start with you. Um, you've previously said that, it, that as a child, people were always telling you what you couldn't be or what you could do and couldn't do. How did you ever figure out what you wanted to be when you grew up? Uh, I don't know if I have yet, but uh, <laughs> I guess it was the, the teachers and the counselors kept telling me all the things that I couldn't do. Uh, uh, thankfully, my friends and my parents just let me do whatever I wanted to do. So I, I, I developed some comfort with making mistakes and getting hurt, as you talked about it falling down. And so when it came time to look for work, since they couldn't tell me what I wanted to do, I just kept trying different jobs uh, uh, until I finally started to find some that I liked. It took a little while, and I did some interesting things along the way. So, exploration. Great. That's a good lesson for everyone, right? Um, Shawna, you were the first person in your family to finish high school, is that right? Correct, yes. Okay. And you thought your life might take a different path if you didn't uh, have arthritis. Can you tell us a bit about that? The reason I 
um, is that we, or our family, was um, on the south side of Edmonton and we were a farm family for over 100 years. And so we were workers, we weren't scholars. So when my disease struck me at the age of 17, I had to change my thinking pattern that I couldn't actually do a lot of physical stuff and I actually had to go back to school and become a certified management accountant and that's what I am today. Great. And was there a school or was there different resources that you used to sort of make that happen for you? I was very fortunate at the time that Grant McEwen was starting, I don't know if it was a new program, but they really helped me able to go to um, school. They gave a lot of accommodations. They allowed me to have extra time with exams and that sort of thing when I needed it. Um, and so, yeah, it was a really great support. And I also found my family to be a really great support when I was going through this. Nice. Families are quite important for, for support and helping us get along. Francine, you've had uh, quite a few jobs. Um, can you tell us a bit about those that um, have taught you something about your skills and abilities? I'm a very hard, <laughs> I'm a very hard worker. I found out that I was. And I just learned if something is simple, I'll just figure out how to do it. I even, uh, when my younger sister is disability, she was bugging me to go up and down the stairs. Sorry, I had no uh, teaching skills for that. So I sat in a staircase and taught her how to go down the stairs and up the stairs on her ass. <laughs> that <laughs> works. <laughs> and then after that, we played a game called come surprise me in my bedroom, come see me in my bedroom, so she could practice going up and down the stairs. So that's how I, I just play around sometimes to figure out how I would be learning uh, new, new skills and practice them. Mm -hmm. Great. How are you um, developing your skills to find it, the job that you want today? Right now I'm just looking for something that I like and I know that I could do so it will be easier. And um, yes, on the side at home, I have a computer, and I did buy a, a uh, pro some learning um, thing for uh, MC, uh, so I get to learn more about that program. And it even has a PowerPoint and other things, so I just work on that on my own time at home after my day is ended. Okay, so you're looking to go back into like an office admin using computers and stuff. Plug yes. for Francine. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Francine. <laughs> Terry, I want to ask you. Um, you didn't know that you had Asperger's uh, till you were 33. So once you had your diagnosis, what did that change or explain for you? Um, one of the did things that it did for me is it helped me understand why I couldn't hold jobs. Um, I had at one point nine jobs in 11 years and I'm thinking, okay, I mean, I obviously have the credentials to get the job, but I didn't know why until the diagnosis and then I realized it was like, number one, because I wouldn't keep my mouth shut about how I felt, because I see, people with Asperger's see things very black and white and I'm not afraid to tell anybody, even the owner of the company, that if I disagree with one of the policies or the rules and I think it can be done better, I'll tell them that way and I won't, I won't mince words. Um, and it was just, it, for me it was very enlightening and it was like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders because there was a reason okay. I behaved and acted and spoke the way that I did. And it was like, okay, well, I know what it's called now and it's cool and I'm a cool person and to heck with the rest of you if you don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> What did, um, so what did it teach you about your strengths? Um, it taught me a lot of perseverance uh, because if I didn't persevere, I wouldn't have had those many jobs in 11 years. And one of the other things it, it taught me is that I, I'm able to focus on the little details. Like I was, I was trying to pursue a designation as a professional accountant. But with Asperger's syndrome and you're black and white, it doesn't work well with management accounting that's shades of gray. Okay. But I can still, I see the small details and I'll find you that penny you're missing, but I can also see the big picture, which is something not a lot of people with Asperger's can do. So I was able to 
take what I had learned with those jobs and just go, okay, well, these are the really good things I can bring to my jobs. You know, maybe I should learn how to shut my mouth so I could keep them, but apparently I haven't done that. <laughs> yeah, well, that's great. It's like they say you kind of have to know where you've been to know where you're going in a sense, right? Yeah. Yeah, great. Francine, like you said, you're currently looking for work, and um, it sounds like it's a full-time job too from what I, what I understand from your path. Um, so can you tell us a bit about um, your job hunt and what you're doing to, to get there. Word of mouth. And is word, yeah, where do you go as well for help? Yeah. Uh, word of mouth is yeah. um, knowing other people that may know people who are hiring. And then if there is a job that interests me, I, I go to see, uh, see, see if it's the right job by doing a job shadowing. I did one. Tuesday and it was very interesting and I would keep on doing a job shadow if the job interests me to do. Okay. Great. Um, Bill, I have a question for you. You've had 30 jobs in 15 different industries in your career. Is that, that's awesome. <laughs> and you're happy along the way. <laughs> and that's great. So, um, but none of these have come from an advertisement, or only one has come from an advertisement. Can you explain how that's been possible for you? Well, the one that came from the ad was the one that I got fired from, so I didn't want to do that anymore. <laughs> no, I, didn't want to do it anyway, okay. Seriously though, um, most of the opportunities that came from came from network, from, and it's been mentioned today, so from people I knew, people talking to people, asking about opportunities. I guess when I think about it, a couple of them came from higher students, but all of the rest came from uh, people who knew me, people when I asked them about employment opportunities. Uh, and it, it was all networks. So it was all people I knew. People I knew who knew other people. Yeah, so it's probably really important to re you know, work on remembering names and you know, grabbing business cards and making up business cards as you go as well, so you have something to hand out and Well, I, and, and I've probably been a little negligent on that part of it. The, uh, uh, but I did, I did listen, I did hear what people had to say, and you respond, and I guess I've never been very shy, so I think that, that helped, because I was willing to engage and talk to people, and they could see a little bit for, um, they could, could see a little bit of what I was capable of before they actually got me to the interview. Okay. Um, to the other folks on the panel, have there been any tools or resources that have helped you in your um, job finding, you know, meaningful work for you? Any other resources that haven't been mentioned or tools? Um, I don't want to call the people who helped me out tools, so I will call them resources <laughs> instead. <laughs> um, there's a couple of people from employabilities, um, Iris Saunders and Corinne Gowers as well. There was Karen Phillips from the Autism Society, um, my spouse, and two of my really good friends who, um, who believed in me. And so I would say the tool is the belief in those people who said, you know, Terry, you can do this, and they helped me over some of the hurdles. Those are my resources. And if it wasn't for those six or seven people, I wouldn't be doing what I do today, and I certainly wouldn't be sitting here. Awesome. For myself, I guess it would be that it was support, support by family, support by friends, anyone. And um, I'm, again, like um, Terry, that, uh, I just go out and do it and hope that uh, people will see me as an individual and not my disability. Right. How has um, employment, and this is a question to the whole panel, um, so you can jump in, how has employment or even unemployment impacted your life? Francine? Unemployment impacted my life that I need to watch my spending can I go and do things that other people would normally do and that will encourage me to do, go, if I want something really bad, I need to go and find a job. And unemployment is also unhappiness, lots of um, illness and stuff. And I just don't want to be around nobody. And with uh, finding a job is happy and I get to meet new people and I get to do what my goals are to, to buy a house and go on vacation and be happier. 
Right. Good. Um, Terry, I want to talk a bit more about your self-employment. You found a good fit in that. Can you just explain a bit about why you love being self-employed and how that works for you? Oh, why you love being self-employed, how it fits for you. Um, with me having Asperger's and being one of the very few people who doesn't have an issue getting up and talking about myself and my Asperger's, I get to give a voice to those thousands of people with Asperger's and autism spectrum disorders who cannot speak for themselves. And for that, I know I am very blessed because otherwise a lot of people wouldn't know how we feel. And one of the other things, well, many of the other things that I love is I know I make a difference every day, every time I work with a student, or if I'm educating the educators, if I'm talking to parents or professionals, and that difference I make with those people will ripple. So who knows where that ripple effect is going to go. And knowing that I make a difference right. is, is the best job in the world. Great. Bill, how about you? Yeah, that's awesome. How has self-employment looked for you and, and how have you decided to, to do that? Um, it's an interesting thing moving from a company to being self-employed and that part of it is that you're your own boss so you can be extremely, uh, you can have a very annoying boss from time to time. <laughs> so, uh, the, I like it because it gives me a great deal of flexibility and a great deal of change. So I can do what I want to when I want to and if I get really tired I can just say I'm going to take a week off and do that. If all my clients are satisfied with that point. So. Okay. There are many jobs um, what am I Sorry. Many jobs sort of come in our lives and then we have to leave them for whatever reason. Um, and I just want to sort of touch base with each of you um, about what have been the reasons that you felt to leave a job? Shauna? Okay, well, for example, because you've actually just left your job. <laughs> yes, just two weeks ago. Uh, the reason why I left my job um, just recently is that there was no growth and I wanted to grow my career, just like any other person wants to grow their career. I'm not getting any younger, so I chose to actually take it. It took a lot of um, heart and soul searching because it was an absolutely great company. They took us to trips to Europe, we got to drink free wine. There was a lot of perks to this job, but I decided I wanted to move up and move on. And uh, yeah, go ahead. I guess for, uh, for me, uh, very similar. I wanted, I wanted more out of the job, more out of the different kinds of opportunities, with one exception, and that's the one job I left to uh, marry my wife. It's because she was in a different city and I couldn't keep my job at home. <laughs> for me, for um, uh, my own employment as a cat giver or a dog giver and housekeeper, I was, um, it, it is a way for me to get some employment when I cannot find any uh, um, uh, employers to hire me at the time. I don't know that I honestly left a job voluntarily. I think I had a lot of help along the way with that. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, most of that is because I don't get the unwritten rules. And you know, there's no filing cabinet anywhere for unwritten rules. And because I didn't have my diagnosis, I couldn't say, hey, this is what's going on with me. Can maybe somebody help me out to learn to become more professional? Or can you like, tell me what the unwritten rules are so you know, I don't have, my, have to open my mouth to change feet? OK. <laughs> Great. Um, being partially sighted, Bill, um, do you tend to tell people that you have a disability? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And it varies from situation to situation. So let's stay focused on the work situation. I guess when I look for work, um, the way that I've been learned how to search for work was you first of all convince the people of what you have to offer. Uh, then you find out whether they offer something of interest. And then if those two things go pretty well, then you, then you begin to negotiate. So for me, if I start that conversation with, uh, about my disability, I'm not, no longer talking about what it is I offer them. It goes the other direction. It's what are the barriers, what are the challenges. So I've always left that to the later part of, of the interview.
interview, and it was mentioned a couple of times today that that's where you have the discussion, the negotiation. You talk about wages, you talk about hours, you talk about the accommodation if you need to. And as, uh, as the last group said, that accommodation is there for everybody, whether that's a, a, a parent with children they have to pick up a drop off. But I wouldn't bring it up until that point in time. In the rest of my life, it just changes the conversation because again, you're now talking about what you can't do and what you can't do. For sure, it's definitely been, you know, put it on the resume, put it in the cover, and I would tend to agree with you. It's an interview conversation, just like salary and benefits and what have you. Um, if we talk about accommodations, um, how many of you have had an accommodation? And do you want to explain a little bit about what the accommodation was, if any? Shauna? Um, well, in regards to a position, I really, truly don't need much accommodation. I usually have just a higher chair, which that's easily accommodated. I tend to um, just have my own, as I call them, tools, such as a grabber of um, things off the floor. I also tend to have, um, or I guess, the filing cabinets. I don't put anything heavy on the lower filing cabinets because I'm not able to pick something off the ground that low heavy. So I tend to use the middle to the upper cabinets. And um, out there than that, I tend to be able to. I just am a little bit slower. And I just can't type, you know, like 90 words a minute, which I don't, uh, a lot of people probably here don't type 90 words a minute either. So, yeah. So that's pretty well. I don't need much, but there are some, some things that I do need. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm similar. I don't, I don't need too much either. Uh, one is that uh, they don't want me to drive, and uh, I agree with that one. <laughs> so that that's, can't be part of it. And, and this, the second one is, is I appreciate it when people don't hand me a thick document to read on the spot, so they give me a little time to do that as well. For me, I don't need that much either. Maybe uh, if I have doctor's appointments or uh, on time off, I need it, and also if I don't understand something then excuse me, could you have five minutes to show me or un make me understand this type of work and that's more or less what I need. It's an interesting question. I do books for a friend and she said, well, what kind of accommodations could I give you? And I'm like, um, well, but I don't really know, but one of the things she offers me is flex time, which is really good. And I work in the office when nobody else is there, so I don't have to worry about distractions. I can be in a bad mood, you know, and, and it's okay. I can swear at my computer if I need to. So I basically just need like a, a room where I can close the door or the flex time where I can be in working by myself. And being as I have my own company and I do that up in my basement, I can get whatever I want. <laughs> Beers, wine. <laughs> <laughs> Self-employment, yeah. Uh, um, so when you were talking about employers and you've introduced your disability, what, um, what's their response? Anyone? Anyone, go for it. For okay. me? Well, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. You go ahead, Sean. Okay, thank you. Um, for myself, I always introduce myself um, with a disability right away in my cover letter because I have prior, um, have not done that, and when I walk into the office for an interview, people are very shocked and they shut down if they had no inkling of me having a disability. So I'm always up front because then I know the employer has an open mind and is willing to take a chance maybe on me if I'm the right candidate. The one and only time I disclosed was not a good scene. Um, I'd been at the company for a while, we got a new HR person in and I disclosed and shortly thereafter I was let go and I think part of it was is I had been recently diagnosed and I didn't understand a lot about myself and what it was I needed so I couldn't convey that to the company that I was working for but that is the last full-time job I ever held because I thought I can't keep doing this to myself. Okay. And if I could just add to um, my, my earlier comments is that um, I, I won't go to an interview where I'm not convinced I can do the work and that's why my disclosure is usually later in the session. If I get the job and later on there is a little issue that I may not understand the work or not as fast as the other people, 
I will say, excuse me, I have a little feeling disability. Could you please make me understand this uh, paper so I can do the job better? Okay. Great. All great, um, you know, not accommodations, but just um, agreements of a better work environment that I think a lot of people can take advantage of. Sure. Um, there are more barriers to persons with disabilities when it comes to finding meaningful work um, and employment. Um, when you're transitioning or moving from job to job or trying to move up in a company in advance, um, what are some of the barriers that you've encountered and, sorry, encountered, and what has helped you sort of navigate that landscape of advancement and sw switching jobs within a company? Yeah. Bill? Um, yeah, and I guess I, I was thinking back and I remember my time with the federal government in that they have quite possibly the smallest print out of any organization in the entire <laughs> planet. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I was thinking how much of a challenge that was. And, and not only do they have, the, they have the small print in two languages as well. So, <laughs> so there was a real challenge uh, in, in, with that uh, in that organization. And, and I, I don't know if I ever successfully resolved that with them. And that was the only organization that ever hired me um, as a person with a disability. Okay. Um, what other barriers? For myself, uh, probably is perception, is that when they first look at me, they look more at my disability than more at my ability, so it's just more teaching people what I'm able to do, not what I'm not able to do. Great. For me, is well, when you're looking at an ad that, that somebody's looking for work, or uh, somebody to do the work, is a uh, the high school maybe, or the speed of typing, or the PowerPoint, or um, certain things into the computer that I may not have that is stopping me from applying for. I just kind of like to echo what Shauna said, like when they see her, you know, they're a little bit taken aback. But for me, the big barrier is, is my disability is invisible. I don't walk around with a flashing neon sign over my head that says, ask me, ask me. So until I do something that is like totally out of the norm, people don't know that I have that disability because I'm the typical of most of us with Asperger's, so I can function fairly well at times. So when you do something a little bit out there, they kind of look at you and go, whoa, why didn't we hire you? <laughs> okay. Yep, that could be, they could, um I think a lot of times it also is perception, and like you say, once, um, well, we have to put it out there and then see what comes back. Bill, you've had quite a, a varied career, and we've sort of talked a bit about it, and previously you've mentioned yourself as being in the twilight of your varied and fulfilling career, um, probably getting ready to retire, I assume? In, in another 25 years or so. Oh, okay, then, good. <laughs> Wouldn't want to lose you. We need you in the masses. Um, so what do you think that uh, a community needs or what we need to allow persons with disabilities to um, realize their full potential? It's, it's interesting. I mean, we've heard a lot about that uh, uh, today and we'll probably hear more about it tomorrow, but I, I really um, don't think I can overemphasize the importance of letting people find out what it is that they like to do, what they want to do, and it was mentioned even in yours, is you have to let them fall down, let them, let them explore. Let them, let them try new things. And then you have to work with, with people. I mean, um, the disability is such a broad spectrum. It's really hard to generalize uh, for, for the whole, whole spectrum. So I guess for me, one of the other important things was uh, being able to read the situation, use some critical thinking to understand what went wrong and what went right. And, and Right, and I'll also put this question out to the whole panel. Um, the question of, um, as the community, as employers, job seekers, uh, persons offering services for people with disabilities and employment, um, what do you think um, that we can do differently to help um, um, people to find meaningful jobs what, um, and to, to find fulfilling careers, just as Bill has mentioned? What can we be doing differently? Give us a chance to to go work for you guys, for whoever is looking for work, and let us 
try out the job and see how you like us working. Just give us a chance to try out the work. I think one of the things is that it helps if you have an understanding of the label that we're given, but recognize that within that framework of a disability, there are a lot of things as individuals that we are capable of, and sometimes people don't like to look past that label. So I think we have to set the bar for each individual so that it's a goal they can reach. Um, their self-esteem increases, their quality of life increases, and then we can set the bar a little bit higher for them because we don't, we're not any different than the rest of you. We have a place where we can fit in. You just have to give us the chance. Uh, you're here. What I find is that uh, I would like to see employers have an open mind and also a creative mind. And what I mean by this is that just because you do a certain job one way does not mean it has to be done that way. Just have an open mind so people can try things a little different than the norm because more than likely it will also work in a different way. And I also think um, if you're going to actually hire someone that's with a disability, you have to also think about the planning because maybe you would want someone in a wheelchair and I think someone on the panel earlier from ATV decided they wanted it, but they couldn't do it because they could not accommodate. So you just have to think about different ways of planning and in your business so that it's a win-win for the employee and the employer. And I also think another option is to be flexible because most people with disabilities have different um, needs such as maybe doctor's appointments, maybe as um, Terry said, needed her own time to be by herself to be able to concentrate. These are some of the things that I think then the employers and the employees will be successful. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to just add to what, uh, what actually everyone has said. It is that we're individuals. Take the time to get to know us and, and respond accordingly. I mean, it's the same thing that every employee asks of an employer. Treat me like an individual. So. Very good. Great. Well, I think what we're going to do is open it up to questions. And we have, um, but before I do that, and everyone can get organized, there's two microphones in the room, and there's also our folks on the web. Um, do any of our panelists have anything they just want to add to sort of close your area uh, and then share with us? I so appreciate the fact that I was asked to come and do this and share a part of my story with you because I think it will help people on the web who are watching and the rest of you see that I'm just like anybody else there. I just have a few more quirks than your average bear. And I'm, I'm really honored to be here to share some of this with, and with you and hear a lot of the other things I've heard today. So thank you. Okay. Thank you for letting me be up here and inviting me to, to be here and learn more about what is we're trying to do to get more people to hire us. Thank you. I guess I'm, I'm just happy to see so many people here who are committed to working to keep things moving forward. And I agree with everyone else that has said that. I also believe that success actually has to come within. I think you have to first start believing in yourself that you're capable of doing the job um, and fighting for the job with someone with a, a or someone with ability slashes normal quote quote so um, the more that we can be out there and show that we can do the job the more people and employers will hire us here here <laughs> all right so do we have um, some questions from the mic we'll just kind of do that sharing rotation thing like mic one mic two the web mic one mic two the web just to make it fair and easy you want to start it off? The web. We got the web. Okay, let's go with the web. Okay, we do have a question from the web from D uh, for the whole panel. Over the history of your careers, have you seen a significant swing within the business sector to understand that your abilities should come first, or is the battle still as difficult as ever? Well, I can start with that because I probably got the longest career. I, I, should say, I could say I've seen progress. I, I don't know if I go so far as a swing yet. But there's been significant progress uh, over over my career, and that people are more interested. Even the employer panel this morning indicated uh, really significant progress. 
over when I first started. I guess the progress for me has been within my own company because I don't really recall from the time I started you know, working full time until I finished that there was much there. And that's a lot because I just didn't know what was going on with me. But I, I've progressed from the time I started my company to now. And I hope that I can continue to do that because then I bring other people along with me. Yes, there is. And I hope there are more, more uh, changes into having disability working people to go and work every day as a, a, a normal person. Um, I also find that the employment situation is on the upswing for people with disabilities, but I still think um, there's a long ways to go. Uh, we need more people to just believe in us, and I think that just education, I think that's all it is, is just education. Ditto. Okay, and we actually do have another question from the web, this one from Hammer. Uh, how receptive are employers to allow job shadowing to see if the job is a fit for all involved? And this would be for all of the panel members. There was one that uh, uh, does it, and uh, he was ha open to it. And uh, I, I took, I, I went and did it with the secretary and him. And then after that, the others, sometimes they, they may be little afraid to see what, what kind of questions job shadowing may be doing or maybe I will take more too much of their time into doing this. But besides that, I think it's really good to do job shadowing. I know that some organizations have internal job shadowing programs. It would be interesting to see if they might, might be open to allowing external people to come in and participate in those programs. Is it? Okay. okay. I do have one question, or a couple of questions for the uh, group up here. Um, one is, how do you feel when somebody says, do you accommodate? Now. I'm sorry, says what? Do we to accommodate? Oh, okay. Oh, let, let's answer that then. All right. Uh, can you hold your second question? We'll just, what do you, what do you guys think? Because I, I think I need so little, it's, for me, it's not a big deal to hear that question. And I work with a lot of people who do need those accommodations. And I think it's a very fair question because some of the people who um, are non-ASPEs need different types of accommodations as well. So why should we not? accommodate everybody, like there's parents who may have to pick up their children, as somebody said earlier. So for me, it's not an offensive question. I think it's a very valid question. I would agree with Terry on that. I think that um, if you think about accommodation in, in a very narrow sense about what kind of equipment or people or processes I have to change uh, to accommodate your disability, uh, I think if you think about it in a narrow, it might be but I think uh, we've heard many times today that it, everybody needs some kind of accommodation in the workplace. It may be little, it may be more, it may be, uh, it may, it may be very simple, it may be more complicated. So in that scope of things, I think accommodation is normal. Okay. Um, and yeah, I mean, duty to accommodate, you're referring to the Alberta human rights, um, duty to accommodate and hardship, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's very much, uh, it's a matter of the carrot or the stick and the perception around that I think is really important. And, um, and knowing a lot of accommodations are not expensive. We, we've sort of heard that today as well. What's the second part of your question? And the second part of my question is, there's two of you going for the same job. And um, being all things are equal, guess what? We're not equal. How do you answer that? Well, I can probably take that on. It is 
since I'm physically disabled and if you and I was up against someone that was able, I think it's just like any job. You have to win it with your personality and your skill. So I, I believe that if you can and you're able to, you will win that job if the person, the employer is open-minded to um, employ someone with a disability. Very good. I guess I've never thought about it in my, in my job search because if I don't win the job, I've never uh, thought it was part of, uh, or related to my disability, uh, and I guess, and so I have a little bit of experience with job search in my career. Um, and, and I always follow up, I always want to find out, and, and if they hide, if, they, if they're not willing to answer the questions, if you get that kind of, uh, we've chosen a candidate whose skills more appropriately fit the position, they're usually hiding something, and it's just not been my experience that it was disability that they were they were shying away from that part. And you yeah, yeah, have to have a discussion here as to who goes next. Um, because my disability is invisible, you know, it was really hard for me to be told. You know, they couldn't say, "Well, you lost the job," or you know, we hired somebody else. I always got the, on any given day, and it's kind of like, well, apparently it's not my day today. <laughs> but when I was working at companies and hiring people, I would, the ones that I interviewed, I would always phone and tell them either way. So that if they didn't get the job, I can say, hey, look, maybe you didn't interview very well on this particular part, and this is, these are the skills you could use to help you in your next position. Because I think it's important that we all learn from everything that we do, so we can all have a chance to grow, and then on some given day, it'll be your turn. I agree with everybody, and also what I was going to say was, if my, my skills are not, it's good enough for me, but not the best for the employer, it's good for whoever got the job over me. I accept it, and I just need to work on, on my skills more better, more often. Right. Great responses. Yeah. Um, it's what I've, this panel is an amazing panel because the attitude and the enthusiasm and the, the responsibility and accountability that we're taking for our own end result is, is very obvious by all four answers that we've had here today. Yeah. It, I don't deserve a job uh, because I have a disability. Right? I deserve the job because I'm, I've got the skills and abilities to do it. Yeah. yeah. Nice job. Oh, another question? Yep. Shoot. Like a question or a comment over here. Um, the panel, um, most of you said your accommodations that you require, you don't feel are, are really all that great. Um, just small little tweaks to your position, then you feel you can fulfill the role. I, I'm sort of looking for feedback and also some thought or just, you know, a comment. Um, my, I'm a parent of a child with an intellectual disability and I don't suspect it's going to be quite a slight an adjustment to help her. Now, we're on board with all the, you know, the good attitude, the work to be the best that you can be. I still believe that there's going to be a little bit more of a dramatic adjustment required. I really enjoyed what um, was said in one of the other sessions about unpacking jobs. And it would be interesting if you have comments or if it's just something that I'm saying, but the, the thought of unpacking jobs, all, all or so many um, employees seem to have too much to do at work. And it would be really neat to um, have people with abil abilities be able to say, I can do this, and then for organizations to go, well, we can unpack that from there, and unpack that from there, and unpack that from there, and guess what? We have a role that makes everybody happy. It lightens the load of those people who have too much going on, and it creates a, a job for someone that fits really well. And again, I can say it's not exactly a question, but with, with you folks needing just slight adjustments to your job, there is a whole other 
part of the population is going to need quite large adjustments to the job. Um, I, I think I think you're absolutely right about the unpacking of jobs, and I guess uh, in, not to minimize the, uh, the need for accommodation. I guess what I need is maybe one piece unpacked for the job, and other people will, will need more. Um, I, I, I really support that. I've seen employers start to look at things that way, and I think we heard an example of it this morning. Uh, so I think it is the way to go for people. Then you can take those pieces together and find the right person for the right job. I think it's an excellent idea, but I can also see some employers going, well, if I take this from this person and something else from this person and help create a job for somebody who I know could be terrific at it, it might be a cost-benefit thing. So they would look at the cost versus the benefit. They will be doing some, something like that. And unfortunately, that's just the way our economy is. They're going to look at what's going to save them the most money as opposed to trying to bring somebody in to fulfill a role that may really need to be filled. I, that's interesting because I think we even heard this morning that um, from a cost-benefit analysis, it sure makes a whole lot of sense not to pay a very high-priced high engineer to do work that you may not need all that education and schooling to do uh, and still create something meaningful for uh, for somebody who didn't have an opportunity. So true. I think we have a question from the web. That's my clairvoyancy again. No. Oh, no. You took it back? <laughs> Thanks. All right. Any other questions from the floor? No. Okay. You just have to prompt them a little bit. Just going back to the question that was posed that Terry answered and Bill came in afterwards. I think it's up to us as, as a society to actually question um, what our needs are in, in the jobs. And um, just because it's all, this is the way we've always done it, doesn't mean that it's the right way to do it. And we have to question those old assumptions that this is your job. Uh, and we're not going to tweak it, or we don't have to revisit. Uh, it's it's actually uh, more efficient if we start doing it like uh, Bill was saying. I believe you wholeheartedly, and in an ideal world, that is where we'll get. But not everybody is that open-minded. I mean, the people in this room obviously are, or else you guys would not be here. And it's going to take us a while to get down that road to where we go, okay, yeah, we can unpack this job and we can have, you know, say Tom doing this particular portion of it and stuff, but we're not in an ideal world yet and it's, it's going to take a lot of time to get there, but, you know, I'm hopeful that we will. We aren't there yet, but it is our responsibility. Just because it's not our fault, it uh, does not mean that it's not a responsibility to change things. And so that's where we might have to be a little bit squeaky and uh, uh, be more, quote unquote, in people's faces. Uh, and uh, because if you look at things like no smoking in the workforce, uh, back in the 60s, that's never gonna happen. And so now it's unheard of. So this is where it starts. It starts with us now. It's our responsibility as a whole to do things to change society. We're aware, and once we're aware, we cannot go back. And we create awareness and all of a sudden we come in contact. So thank you very much. Good very good point. You know, one thing he said is we need to be in your face. Anybody wants lessons, I'm an Aspie. I can teach you all about being in your face. <laughs> <laughs> great. So, okay. So, um, great. Shall do. So, I just want to thank Terry, Francine, Bill, 
and Shauna for taking time out of your busy day for hanging out with us and sharing your experiences and really sort of opening it up for us to see what is it like um, to go down your journey. So thank you so much. Thank you.